final. And people tend to get scared by it. Hello, Houston. We were just talking about grading, which is, of course, going on even now as we finish the second exam, which will be sent to you if it hasn't been already. Um, I hope you're not delaying the watching of this tape until the final is only three days from now, but that'll be your problem if you decide to do that. In any case, uh, we did talk about mass versus distributed practice. I'm a fan of distributed practice. Let's jump right in here in the middle because we kind of dropped something in the middle uh, last time in our discussion. And we'll, we'll look first of all at, at uh, what we're talking about on the screen. Just as a reminder, the major kind of thing that we were talking about last time was various types of transformational problems, all of which have, as you'll remember, three different states that are associated with them. One is the initial state, whatever the problem is that's being posed to you. Secondly, what they do in these problems typically is to give you the final or goal state. That is, they specify what the condition is to be at the end. And most of the problem, per se, actually involves um, trying to come up with a, a solution to the problem, whatever that may be. And one of the most common ways in which that's done is to do what is called a means ends analysis or means end analysis and that is simply developing a, um, a plan of operation that's used to solve various kinds of transformational problems by eliminating the differences between that initial state and the, um, the specified solution or goal state as it is, is variously called. One of the major entanglements that we tend to get into is one of the things I want to talk about today, and that is that one of the major entanglements when we're trying to solve uh, various kinds of transformational problems. We tend, for instance, to, to fall into um, an example of what is called I kept throwing in the missionary problem. I love that problem. But in essence, one of the things we get hung up with is functional fixedness. Okay? This was originally proposed by Dunker way back in 1945. And what he did was, was to talk about what is the effect of previous experience on current problem solving. When that hangs you up, when that becomes not a beneficial experience, but rather a limiting factor of what you do, um, you have um, functional fixedness, essentially. The classic example that, that Dunker uh, developed involved the, the use of three buckets, or they can be jars, doesn't matter how you describe it. But in essence, the challenge to you is to use those, those buckets to try and create the X factor. And so if you're given 21 buck, uh, uh, sorry, a 21 gallon bucket, a 100 gallon bucket, well, that's too heavy. Let's talk about quarts. 21 quarts, 127 quarts, and six quarts. How can you use those three buckets to actually end up with a hundred quarts in the, in the system that you're trying to, to create? And of course the solution in that case, although it's a little bit difficult to come up with the first time, is simply um, 21 uh, subtract, that is taking 127, you subtract from it 21, and that in fact gives you the, um, the oh, and then subtract this three factor twice. So let me, let me start again. You start with 127, you subtract 21, gets you to 106. You subtract three twice, that gets you down to 100, which is the goal in that case. And secondly then, we have, I think what I did was to hit a button that I shouldn't have here. I gave you all the answers, but we can talk about them anyway. Okay, if you're trying to end up with 21, you start with 42, same rule. You end up subtracting nine, which gets you back to 33. You subtract six, which gets you back to 27, and six more gets you back to 21. And so pretty quickly, we begin to work out this formula. In essence, that, that it's the first factor, 163. Oh, okay, here we go. I'm showing you how we did it. I didn't do what I thought I did, but in any case. In the third case, you take the 163, subtract the 14 from it, and subtract 25 twice, and the net result is nine. Uh, 99, actually, the, the other nine is over there. Trust me on that. Um, and what that leads to, ultimately, as you begin to work on it, is a formula. And that formula, which solves each of those, as I'm sure you've probably seen at various times, is simply the B bucket minus the A bucket minus two times the C bucket. And each of those formulas will work. So when you are so proud of yourself for having developed that formula, you then check it out on the next one. Sure enough, 43, the middle bucket, minus the A bucket, minus two times the C bucket, and bingo, you've got five, which is the target. And lo and behold, it works here. 59 minus 20 is 39, minus 20 is 19, minus four two times is 11. And that ends up with the, um, that ends up, well, wait a minute. Let me try that again. Did I make an error? I'll bet I did. Scratch this example. Doesn't work. But how about this one? 
That one is deliberately, as the, as the final example, is deliberately intended not to be able to... Uh, now I am right. Okay, 59 minus 20 one time, I was trying to do it twice, is 39 minus 8 is 35 minus, uh, sorry, minus 4 is 35 minus 4 is 31. I feel better. So in any case, you're scrambling along just pleased as punch that you've developed this formula and all of a sudden you hit this one. And when you subtract 76, uh, 28 from 76, B minus A, you get back to uh, 48. You subtract 3 twice and you're down to 42. And wait a minute, that doesn't equal 25. And so the net result is a problem. And of course, if you look at this and get hung up on that, what you're demonstrating basically is functional fixedness. Because in this case, it's actually quite easy. It's A minus C to give you X. That's the solution. But if you're, if you're tied up in the formula that has been developed here, very effectively solving each of the problems, bingo, you land in functional fixedness. Because you're now, you're not standing far enough back from the problem to realize that psychologists are tricky and they tend to screw us up in various ways. And so you end up being functionally fixed in, in, the, in the various attempts that, you, um, that you, you, you utilize there. And so in that case, there is a solution. It just happens to be a lot easier than taking the B bucket away from A and the C bucket twice. So the net result is that we're going to define functional fixedness simply as the inability to envision available objects performing the required task. And so if you get too tightly enamored of, of B minus A minus 2C or, or whatever, um, you don't have the right solution when you get to the last problem. That simply won't work. There's another example of this that I find just, I, this is another of the problems that I particularly like, so I'm going to pose it for you here. Simmel, in 1953, developed another really fascinating problem that can be solved, but it is quite tricky. Okay? The situation that was involved here was a, a um, you're given eight coins. One of them is a counterfeit, which weighs less, but it looks identical. You can't tell among my eight there where the, the dead ringer actually is, the, the, the ringer. Um, but can you identify the counterfeit by using an available balance? I'll give that to you. I'll give you a balance with which to work this out and find the light one, but I'm only going to allow you to, to use it twice. That's where the problem comes. Can you, in fact, take those eight coins and figure out a way to divide them in such a way that you can actually isolate the single light coin among the eight? And it can be done but it's kind of tricky. Most people tend to jump into the idea of, okay, I've got seven coins and a, and a fake. How do I find it? Whoops, I'm only going to get to weigh twice. So most people tend to think of the solution as simply, uh, okay, I'm going to divide this in half. And that's all right, because if you put that on the, on the, um, on the scale, uh, one side or the other is going to weigh, is going to go higher. It's going to be lighter, and therefore the heavy side that has genuine coins will drop down. But the problem is now you've got one stack of four coins within which you know is the fake. You've only got one more weighing. And so all you can do at that point is divide it into two and two. And, two. Uh, and you're still left, even if you figure out that your stack has one of the, one of the two in it. If, worse, if it doesn't, because if it does, then you've solved it. But if it doesn't, if the two are balanced, then that means the, the, the fake is not among them. So you've still got one more weighing that you need. So if you go eight to one, you've got to do three weighings. That's not going to solve the problem in the two weighings I've given you. So let's don't do that. It turns out there's another way that you don't have to weigh some of the objects, and that will put you into the situation where you can actually solve it. So in this case, instead, let's divide it this way. Let's divide it into three stacks of three, three, and two. You can probably see where I'm headed with this, but the solution is actually to take the scale, beautiful scale I've developed here for you, and the easiest thing to do is to weigh all six. In, in the best of all worlds, they'll be equal, and then all you have to do is weigh the second pair one time. But in this case, let's suppose there's a problem. If, if it turns out that the, the six were balanced, then you can weigh the, the other two and end up with this kind of a situation, which means then that the, the, um, the, the light one is here. So we've isolated two weighings. We've eliminated six at the beginning and then split the others and, and solved it. But now let's go the other direction. Let's suppose, in fact, that we end up with this kind of situation. And here we find this. That's telling us, of course, that the, the um, heaviest one, the, sorry, the lightest one, the fake, is in this group. We've still, remember, only got one weighing. 
but it is possible to solve this problem. And that is that what we're going to do is we can set aside the other three and, in fact, the other two. The, the five of the eight are eliminated now, so we're down to only three that have to be weighed. And we follow the same principle that we did in the division into three, three, and two. That is that we divide the coins this way, into one, one, and one. And again, we can weigh. If it ends up in this situation, then this is the, the, the fake. But if we end up with, with either of these things tipping so that, it, it, uh, so that the two that are weighed tip, then the one that is higher is, is the identification. So in this, in this particular move, weighing two out of the three coins, you've got the solution. The scale goes up on one side or the other, identifying the light one, or it remains balanced, which means the third one is the, is the correct answer. So in fact, we have solved that problem of eight coins with one being lighter in only two weighings. But the key there is coming up with the idea of, of um, actually dividing the coins, not simply four and four. And so in essence, Dunker um, proposed a couple of different types of thinking that he suggested were, were um, utilizable here. Um, one of them is what he called analytical thinking. And in that, what he was talking about, manipulating the objects to reach conclusions. Um, in that case, the most simplistic example, and it really is simplistic, is, is essentially if you're trying to solve the problem, what color is the skin of an orange? Um, we process it into, into recognizing that an orange has skin and the skin of the, of the fruit is, in fact, orange. And so although it sounds pretty simplistic, there is a fundamental logic involved there in taking the, the problem, divided it into the components. And there's essentially nothing in the conclusion that you couldn't have reached from, 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 um, from well, it, it, the logic by which you go through that is simply the, the cold application of very simple maneuvers. If we compound the thing, we can, you can appreciate that we can significantly increase the complexity of, of what's going on in that situation. But in fact, the other type of thinking that, that Dunker talks about is what's called synthetic thinking. And here what he's talking about is, is where you can, for instance, um, construct mental objects um, to, to utilize or represent essentially the problem that you're talking about. One example of that involves the following. Let's suppose that I give you the following kind of logic, okay? Alan is taller than Richard. Richard is taller than Frank. And the question is, is Alan taller than Frank? because that's not been in the premises directly. It can be demonstrated, but it's not been in the premises. So the question is, can we order that? And in essence, what you can do, start with a field, and I've actually put some grass in it for you so it's not denuded or brown or dusty. It's, you know, it's healthy. We're going to put in there, whoops, we've got to put some pants on him, Alan. What we concluded was that Alan is taller than Richard, so we've got that kind of a relation that can be drawn. I've overdrawn it. You could do it graphically, of course. And we know also that Richard is taller than Frank. And so in answering the question, is Alan taller than Frank, we can do this directly from the, the comparison of the graphs here, even though the, or the diagrams, even though in that case the answer is not directly supplied in the information I gave you. It has to be derived from it. The conclusion, in other words, was not contained in the premises that I gave you, but after construction, a conclusion could be reached. Again. It's, uh, it's more simplistic in the description than, in fact, in, in real-world problems it would probably be. But here you get out of this more than you actually put into it. That is, by, by adding the, the uh, orientation among the three figures that are talked about, you can actually um, uh, solve the problem. You can extract from it the problem. For Dunker, es essentially, uh, insight is achieved when simple parts are combined to form a new whole. He was coming at it from a rather gestaltist perspective. But his idea was that by using, by, by expanding the model that you've gotten, I mean, I could have given you a whole series of things like uh, Alan is taller than Richard, Richard is taller than Stephen, Stephen is taller than, you know, and we can extend that out to 12 or 15 terms if we want to go crazy. Um, but in essence, um, you're, you're being posed a series of problems which lead to construction, which in fact then through synthetic thinking, as Dunker was labeling it, can be used to solve the, um, the problem. I want to go back and visit one more time an old friend of ours, and that is the nine dots problem. You remember what was involved there? You were, you were to, talk, to take those nine dots and connect them with four straight lines, and of course the solutions you've got are that uh, you can do any of the four directions, but the correct solution is actually to do, as we've, as we've already showed you here, 
and that is to draw beyond the edge of the box. And so in that case, that's an example of a, a um, confounding situation in the, in the particular, can you connect all nine dots with four straight lines without taking your pencil off the paper? Fixation occurs when subjects write an unnecessary rule. And one of the things that people tend to do there is that you, you um, can't stray outside of the implied box and as, as involved in this, um, in this puzzle. Okay? When you do that, three out of your four lines uh, are eliminated. That is, you can't actually do that. And thus what happens is that by writing that extra rule can't go outside the box, what you've essentially done is frustrate your ability to solve the, um, the, the situation. So where initially from that first line you could draw out to the right, straight up, diagonally up to the left, or across to the left, or anywhere else you wanted to go. Those are all but one pro prohibited. You can draw straight up, but only two more squares. And the net result there is that what you've done is to write a rule for yourself that essentially frustrates the, um, the solving of the, of the problem. And so in essence, the fixation occurs when we write that unnecessary rule. Weisberg argued in 1986 that essentially, I'm getting behind myself here, hang on a second, I'll get to it. And that is that um, Weisberg versus Ellen had two very significantly different reads on this particular problem, and in fact on problem solving generally. And in fact, what Weisberg argued in 1986 was that the Gestalt view holds that once fixation is broken, the solution either appears whole or in a flash, in other words, through insight, or is produced smoothly as one step leads to another. That's in page 45 of his 1986 publication on the, on the matter. This is not what happens, argued Ellen. Okay, Ellen, in 1982, argues differently. What she's doing is using Meyer's classic string problem. And so Weisberg was arguing essentially that it's all at once or smoothly, that is, you move directly and efficiently from, from confusion to solution. Ellen, on the other hand, is arguing that, in fact, we get sudden changes um, that occur. And the, the solution that she offers is, is Meyer's classic string problem, which, he's always shared, which we've already shared with you once before. And changes in meaning and organization occur suddenly, she is arguing. Okay? Often this sets off, that is to say, often what this sets off is, is unexperienced or not consciously recognized. And so when you're faced with this kind of a problem, um, Ellen is arguing that, that, in fact, before the solution is there, there is basically disharmony. We simply do not appreciate uh, or cannot understand what the problem that we're facing is in, in this particular situation. And so that this often um, leads to a state of disharmony. And in fact, uh, the, the experienced unconscious, uh, we may be unaware of some of the things that are going on, but the disharmony is very obvious. We cannot grasp the relationship of things in the room to the required solution. And in the string problem, there was an extra pair of pliers or a screwdriver or something or other with weight to it so that you could actually set that second string swinging. But until you conceptualize that seemingly irrelevant tool as in fact being crucial to solving the problem, um, until you experience having an idea, the net result is going to be uh, confusion and, and disharmony. The new organization, according to Ellen, uh, is suddenly there, uh, becoming uh, essentially dominant in the, in the particular situation. Um, another way to look at this, another, another um, experience, another way to demonstrate the particular phenomena, there are two others that I want to point out to you. One is the, the staircase illusion that we talked about once before, where in fact you, you can fairly easily picture yourself being upstairs looking down on this so that I've added the, the, the cover of the stairs to, to accentuate that read. And it's very easy to view that from the top looking down. That is, we're on the balcony. On the other hand, we can use that very same drawing and encourage you to, to be downstairs looking up. And in fact, the hints that we give you are exactly the same. But it takes, nonetheless, some act of will for you to look at that and envision yourself as walking downward. The thing that I found helpful was to think about the fact that if you envision somebody walking down these stairs where you're downstairs looking up at them, all you're going to be able to see is their legs here. Okay? If, if in fact, you're downstairs in the cellar looking at the underside of a staircase, then the only thing you're going to be able to see is, is a pair of legs going down here or maybe the waist of the individual who's walking down the stairs if this is the only view that we have. Because remember, this edge is projecting closest to us. 
Okay, and so the staircase is moving down this direction, because remember now we're looking at the bottom of the stairs, and therefore the only way to envision it is that these are the, 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 the only way to be on top of this staircase if you're down in the cellar is to be on the reverse side of what we're looking at here, and that is you're walking down the stairs this way. I'm just leading to confusion here. Trust me. Play with it. You're going to have to work with that one a little bit. Let me pose another one to you where I can give you some more hints, and that is the, the Necker cube, uh, which is another brain twister. This one will also cause you to, to get bent out of shape trying to solve that. Um, but in essence, the, the box illusion, if we envision this, and the easy one here is to envision yourself as being above the box looking into it. Okay, and in that case, that's the kind of diagram that we, we would get out of that illusion. Okay, if you envision yourself from taking that, that total three-dimensional cube where you can see all of the lines, all of the corners, and so forth, that's the way you would ultimately envision it if, in fact, you're looking down on it from the top. Okay, but then on the other hand, I can now switch it in another direction. If we start from here, now what I'm going to force you to do is to look at it from underneath. Look at it as if this square, the one here, is actually the bottom, okay? And we're actually seeing this surface as the underside of the bottom of the box. And to aid you, what I'll do is not that one, but we'll get there in a minute. There we go. There we are. Okay, I headed the wrong direction on my button pushing. But in essence, the same diagram is being used there. It's just now that we're changing your orientation. And in fact, if it were truly a solid box, that's all you'd be able to see of it if you're underneath it. That is, you can't look in and see the back surface or anything like that. Um, and so in essence, uh, what Metcalf and Weed, Weeb uh, in 1987 did was to argue against uh, the kind of debate that had been going on between Weisberg and, and uh, Ellen. Um, and basically what they did was, was to talk about two different types of problems that we can in fact utilize. Well, I'll eventually get out of that. Let go of that box. Go away. Okay. So in essence, what, what Metcalf, Metcalf and Weeb did was to argue that in essence what we're really distinguishing between here is problems that are solved with insight versus those that are solved without insight. And there was a rather interesting study that was done to, to demonstrate what they were actually talking about in, in that situation. They are arguing essentially that if you look only at those problems that are solved without insight, what happens is that you and I display a stepwise progression. That, that's the kind of thing that goes on, for instance, in math or algebra problems. When you're solving those, you know, you know the logic that teachers teach you ultimately of starting with the, the givens and working toward the complexity or solving a, an equation for x, the steps by which you parse it out into its, its various parts. And what that generates is essentially a stepwise solution. Line one, when you're presented with the problem. Line two, whichever is the first uh, division out that you, that you make or separation. That what you should be able to do is actually verbalize it as, as it occurs. That is, as you work out the problem, you could offer to the teacher or a friend, here's what I'm doing. I'm, you know, when I've got the, the, um, the um, um, quadratic equation, I'm going to divide by x. And you'll see that what happens here is, in, you know, you can, you can illustrate what's actually going on in that situation. And in fact, what, what um, Metcalf and Weeb did was to argue that basically if you, you ask subjects to state how close they are to the actual solution, they can feel and report actually feeling, warmer is maybe the wrong word to use, but increasingly confident that the solution is being approached. That is, as, as the math works out, as you move through the steps of the equation, what grows within you is a feeling of warmth or confidence that you, in fact, are on the right track and you're going to be able to get to that particular solution. And so what they did was to create problems and basically ask subjects to rate the likelihood that they would be able to solve the problem. And the results were that with, with non-insight problems, subjects could rate the likelihood that they would solve the problem. Okay. And so in this particular situation, the graph that we're going to give you looks like this. Okay? We're talking about time to solution on the, on the x-axis and the, the rated warmth, how confident they feel, essentially, that they're going to be able to solve the problem. And in essence, in this case, when we're dealing with, with non-insight problems, S's could rate the subject, subjects that is, could rate the, the um, confidence that they felt in that they were moving toward a solution, particularly if they were solving a, a math problem, the rules for which they knew, that is, the solution rules for which they knew. So the closer they got to the end state, the more positively they rated their warmth. Now, this is a bit of a smooth function, but essentially what's being shown here is that the rated warmth on a, on a um, seven-point scale 
is increasing. For insight problems, no such anticipation exists. That is, if you look at the red curves here, what you see here is, is what they found in situations where the problem was kind of aha or oh, and so forth. That, that's, the, that's the insight issue that's being talked about there. And if you were to ask people to rate how confident they are in solving that particular problem as a function of where they are in progressing through the problem, what you find is the kind of curves that you see with the, with the red function there. And that is that they just don't have a clue until all of a sudden that, oh, gee, or something like that occurs, and the problem that, you know, from that point on, the pencil's in their hand, they're moving frantically. And um, these judgments are basically metacognitive, if, if you want to think of it that way. They're, they're basically a feeling of knowing or a feeling of growing warmth or comfort that you're headed in the right direction. They do not occur with respect to insight problems because insight is conceptualized as something you do or experience, not something you plan. It happens, okay? Lockhart, Lehman, and Gick in 1988 studied another source of, of difficulty, and that is the, the, um, the inability to see something you know is needed for a solution. And in that case, it's going to look like the inability to detect the necessary information. Okay, give you an example of the kind of problem that was being used here. A man married three women in a small town. I, I, located it in Houston for the purposes of the illustration. But all of them are still living. All of the women and the man who married them are all still living. They all know both each other and him, and yet he has never had to divorce any of them. Why? Anybody know the answer? There is a stunningly simple explanation for that when you think about it a minute. I'll give you 10 seconds to worry about it. You get an A in the course if you solve it now. Did he ever see any of them? Yeah. Yeah, he sees all of them. Yeah, and they see each other. Well, I'll add one minor hint across the article for you. The man is a member of the clergy. And so he married the three women. But he was the one who caused the marriage, performed the marriage. He was not the one who was involved in the marriage. That is, he was not the husband being created in that family union. Okay? And so, in essence, the, the, um, even a hint that is given at the wrong time um, may be helpful, such as telling may or may not be helpful, it may be harmful, it may not be helpful. Basically, if you tell the, uh, the problem solvers to be, clergymen perform many different marriages. And then you go into, leading into, you know, the man as indicated in the article there, a local man married three women in a small town. The disjunction between clergy as the person who would probably do that or a member of the clergy and, and the women um, makes enough of a disjunction that, that people sometimes don't leap that gap and keep in mind the idea or thinking about clergy. But it's a very clever solution. I like that was a teaser problem for me. I liked that when I first tumbled across it because it took some real getting into it to figure out exactly what was at issue. And in fact, truth to tell, I looked up the answer. That was one I just, you know, they were, they're just, there's enough there to tingle you, but not enough to actually lead you directly to a solution in that case. William James actually talks about what we're talking about here in a concept we're going to put on the screen for you, and that is he actually wrote about what is called sagacity. And that goes all the way back to, to his book back in, in uh, 1890. And he was defining sagacity as basically the ability to discover what is essential about a situation. You could also think of it as, as the ability to see a situation and to discriminate the important aspects. Okay? Both of those are, are what, what James was actually talking about with sagacity. And in that case, the, the missing information in the problem that I just posed for you on screen there, posed for you, was, was the fact that it was a clergyman who was, who was performing the marriage. But, but, and that's highly relevant. So if I had given you a hint previously talking about the fact that uh, you know, clergy perform many weddings and so forth and so on. But if I'd done it casually and in, with no direct tie to the problem, 
the likelihood that any of us would have seen that as being relevant uh, would not be n would not be high. The odds would be quite low, and in that case, we the our sagacity would be quite low. Making the link between the hint and how to apply it to the problem wouldn't be so obvious. And in fact, what Lockhart and did was to Lockhart and others did was to study the way in which we implant or impart sagacity. And so, in one case, it was done basically by a um, a declarative sentence. Um, something like, it made the clergyman happy to marry several women a week, as he might in, as being the local uh, clergyman. Um, on the other hand, in other cases, the way the sagacity was presented to people, or sorry, the way the information was presented to people, varying the, the uh, sagacity, was essentially a problem on one side of a card. The man married several women each week because it made him happy. And then on the flip side of the card was simply one word, clergyman. So in fact, the, the uh, reverse side answers the question there. But the, the hypothesis, what was hypothesized was that the puzzle format would lead subjects to process information in a manner making it accessible later on. That is, in, in kind of thinking through what the, what the uh, puzzle itself was, the man, let me give it to you again, the man married several women each week because it made him happy. Thinking that through um, obviously would not be the case that you and I could go around marrying people several times a, a week um, without an extraordinarily expensive divorce and so forth. But in any case, solving that problem, which is relatively easier than the, than the news article that I gave you originally, lead, leads you to engaging in the cognitive activities that you're likely to need to use in order to solve the problem when you read the, the newspaper article as I posed it to you. Um, the results that were, were developed by um, by um, Lockhart and, and the others as, as they did the study um, were as predicted. That is, uh, offering the clue beforehand in a puzzle form significantly increased the ability to solve a problem because of the greater uh, availability of relevant information in the, in the, f in the applicable form. Uh, that is what was needed to solve the, the eventual problem that was involved there. So the, the um, Another problem that's related here is the, is the uh, problem of um, rigidity. And in fact, if we can put that on the screen, I want to go back and look at one of the, the um, definitions that is involved in that. If you think about, for instance, um, the, the Lucan's water jar problems that we, we um, used earlier with jars A, B, and C, it can be solved early on with the simple formula, jar B minus jar A minus jar C minus jar C. Uh, that is the formula B minus A minus 2C works. What this does, however, is to lead subjects to develop a set, or what the Gestaltists called an Einstellung. And we define that simply as a, a specific model of responding to a problem. But then the last problem, A equals 23, B equals 49, C equals 3, and the goal, X equals 20, A minus C works fine, but it may not be found if the formula that you've developed is too firmly set in place. Lukens actually tested over 5,000 subjects in demonstrating that particular phenomenon. And what he found was that increased pressure to perform quickly and accurately greatly increased rigidity among sixth graders, for instance. Even when told that a simpler solution existed, even when they were given that last formula, uh, that last uh, problem, uh, having developed the, the um, B minus A minus 2C, when the pressure is put on them, give me the answer, it's very obvious, it's right there, just use your head, look at it, it's right there. That kind of pressure decreases performance. Interestingly enough, that is one reason, for instance, that the tests that I give you are not 1,400 items long with an hour to do it all. That's a high pressure test and, and basically, uh, I'm a little off track here but it's relevant, and that is that the, uh, the, the rank ordering from best to worst is the same whether we give you a high pressure many, many, too many questions kind of test or we give you a simpler test where you can think your way through each of the, uh, the answers. You end up with the same in the low pressure or no pressure testing situation. You end up with the same rank ordering from those that know the material best to those that don't know it so well. Uh, and so I see no reason to add the pressure. Going all the way back to Lucan's and the water jars, there's some tie of my testing to classic research in terms of the way we do it. So Langer in 1989 conceptualizes the, the flexibility rigidity dimension as being one of, of mindfulness or mindlessness in this particular situation. Okay, um, 
And so he's, he's, uh, we can essentially create the kind of, of parallel that we've got on the screen there, and that is that, that basically being mindful is essentially being sensitive to or open to other possibilities. And on the other hand, mindless is an act as if the, the situation has only one possible solution. And what he's doing, um, Langer is doing, uh, she actually, is doing, is, is tying here mindfulness to flexibility and mindlessness to rigidity. And the way in which she's doing it essentially is defining mindful as an act of, of uh, uh, or acting as if a situation has only one possible solution. Sorry, mindless. Let me go through that again. Mindful is defined as simply, the problem was I reversed them in my notes and didn't see the arrow telling me to talk about mindful first. But in essence, what's involved there is on screen is simply that if you're mindful in a problem-solving situation, you're sensitive to, you're open to other possibilities. That is, when you look at the information that you're given, you don't ignore things, you don't close out any possibility. You don't, for instance, write a rule that you have to stay within the box um, in the nine dots problem because that was never included in, in the information that you were given, so you don't put it in. That's a more mindful solution. Um, it also is identified then by, by flexibility. And then on the other hand, if you're mindless, in essence, what, what happens is in that situation is that you act as if the situation has only one possible solution. There's no way to do it but this way. Uh, and then if this way doesn't work, you're stuck. Uh, to be one mindful at the start doesn't mean that one will not become the other. That is mindless later on in an experiment. Okay, Langer and Piper described a, a toy declaratively as, this is a child's chew toy. Okay, that's defining it uh, declaratively. All right. Um, on the other hand, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Yeah, there we are. Uh, declaratively, this is a child's chew toy. But on the other hand, they could also describe it conditionally. They could say, for instance, this could be a dog's chew toy. And in that case, what they've done is, oh, and I misspoke earlier. What I should have said is this is a dog's chew toy, not a child's. Um, declaratively, it's simply the, st the declarative statement, this is a dog's chew toy. And in the other case, conditionally, it's done as this could be a dog's chew toy. The key difference there being between is as opposed to could be. Later, when the researcher needed an eraser, subjects were much more likely to suggest the dog's chew toy previously introduced conditionally. That is, when the, the, the chew toy that they'd been talking about was then just put aside casually on the counter. It was still there. And he writes something on the board as part of his discussion and then needs to erase it and goes through the kind of fumbling as you've seen instructors do where they're looking for something to use. And in fact, the class, the members of the, of the group in that were much more likely to suggest, why don't you use the dog? Uh, why don't you use the chew toy? <laughs> Not the dog, the chew toy. Uh, to, to basically solve the, the uh, problem. And so essentially, a more mindful response is essentially one in which you, you do the, the conditional introduction or consideration of the toy. It could be, or it might be, which is not to say that it's, o that it's, that's its only possible use. Maybe you've simply got a very decorative eraser, which turned out to be true. And so essentially what we do is to conclude that responding conditionally to new concepts and occurrences is a key predecessor to mindfulness. Unconditional description may be efficient, but it is efficiency achieved at the cost of increased rigidity. The one tends to lead to the other. So then we get to the core of this chapter, this series of lectures, and that is, okay, you've told us all this, how do you solve problems? There's a very famous book on that topic by Polya, and in fact it's called, logically enough, How to Solve It. It was written by Paglia in 1945, recopyrighted in, in 1957. And he talked in that book about heuristic problem solving. Remember, we talked about heuristics um, once before, and I said we'd return to it. Well, here we are. What I want to do is, is just redefine for you as a kind of reminder definition of the fact that we talked about heuristics as generally strategies often, but not always helpful in solving a problem. You can think of it as a practical strategy, okay? The key to the heuristics is simply the fact that it may lead to a solution, but it doesn't have to. So there is ever the possibility that if you choose the wrong heuristic, you're going to end up wasting an extraordinary amount of time. That can happen. Um, but in general, <coughs> excuse me, a, a heuristic will, will demonstrate its efficacy simply by allowing you to solve a problem um, more efficiently. 
without going through all of the different possible combinations. So I want to talk a little bit about the diff various types of, of uh, heuristics that are available to us. Uh, and in fact, the very first one that I want to talk about is, surprisingly enough, the availability heuristic. We're going to, to define that essentially as, as basically how easily um, do examples come to mind. And that influences, the ease with which we can get examples to come to mind influences our estimate of the likelihood of any particular event occurring. That's the availability heuristic. If examples come to mind too easily, we tend to overvalue it, okay? We draw the bases for decisions from our own experience. That makes sense. If we overestimate its typicality, then we are subject to the availability heuristic. That is, if you think in, in trying to solve any particular situation or form a, a position relative to something you've observed, the ease with which you're able to draw parallel examples may sometimes falsely trigger you into um, overestimating the likelihood that something will occur. Give you a specific example, and there are several of these that can be found in the literature. One of them has to do with K, the other one has to do with R. But in both cases, it takes the following formula, is a form. That is, the question that's being posed to you is, um, is K more likely to occur in the first position or the third position of a five-letter word? Most people tend to guess. What's your guess? Is K more likely in the first or the third position of a five-letter word? Show of hands. How many prefer first position? How many prefer third position? Ah, we've done the reading. That's good because that is the correct answer. The vast majority of people who haven't taken cognitive psych and done the reading, however, tend to guess the first position because of the fact that they can come up with more examples of it. Knowing, knows, got to have five letters there. But in any case, it, it's, you're much more likely, ultimately, if you actually count in the dictionary, to find words like asked, A-S-K-E-D, which turns to be um, far more frequent. K is in the third position much more than it is in the first position, but the, the, the issue of availability is what's biasing our, our thinking in, in, in answering that particular problem. Um, notice weather forecasters here in Houston, if you think about it, they, they are guilty of the availability heuristic because in essence when we have a severe thunderstorm, as happens here in Houston, we get some pretty savage storms every now and then. The water tends to mount up, we get flooding in various areas of the city, and sure enough, one of the things you can predict is that the weather for the next day, even if it's a front that's simply moving through and it's going to be clear blue the next day, what you find them saying instead is that the, the weather forecast for several days afterwards will, will especially the next day, will include a, a, um, a prediction of s possibility of serious thunderstorms. And in essence, all it is is the availability heuristic that is biasing the way in which they're interpreting the data. I'll have some more to look at in terms of confirmation bias a little bit later. But the availability heuristic is, is basically the, the source of what you can confirm for yourself. And that is, watch the next time we have a major storm here in the city. That the predictions the next day will be couched in terms of the possibility of or 10% chance of. There's always that 10% um, that we'll have a major thunderstorm. The availability heuristic is, is what's operating there. Um, we had a major gas uh, increase in gas prices here during the summer of 2008. Uh, and, and right now, uh, the, the likelihood in, in the several years following 2008, the likelihood is much lower because we've, we've so cut back on our driving uh, and the size of the cars that we're driving and so forth, that the, the likelihood of that, that escalation occurring again to four or five dollars a gallon is, is not particularly likely to occur in that, uh, in that situation. So we're engaging in a, um, a period of reduced prices. But you still hear people talking about, it's going to go up again. We're going to get socked by it. And again, it's the availability heuristic because it was so graphically available to us every time we gasped in that summer. Uh, and so in the years immediately following, we all tend to hark back to when the, the gas signs were just yelling at you. Uh, and in fact, they were yelling at you very high prices. One of my favorite examples in all of psychology is, is an extension of this, and that is what's called, what you may have read about, called an illusory correlation. Okay? That is essentially an availability heuristic operating in a slightly different form. But in essence, it's an example of that kind of heuristic. And the, the, what's involved there is where the correlation between two events is so close that you falsely assume that the one has caused the other. 
That is that the correlations, as you know, simply involve co-relation between two events. But in fact, we tend to attribute it to cause and effect. Phil Zimbardo, a number of years ago, suggested to me the following uh, example, and I've always loved it as an illustration, and that is, picture this, um, nighttime dusk in, in Boston. Kid has been practicing down on, on the uh, coastal level, and he's walking up um, the famous hill in Boston. And as kids do at age 10 or 11, he's carrying with him a baseball bat, and what he's doing is taking practice swings you know, practicing to, to move to become the mighty, uh, whoever is the current king run, uh, run king, home run king here. So in essence, he was repeatedly swinging the bat as he was going, practicing his perfect swing, holding of the, the bat, everything else. And he would take a swing at mailboxes and they'd make a loud noise and if nobody was around, he'd take another swing uh, and so forth. And he was walking along just batting at objects that happened to be around and inanimate, luckily enough. Um, and then he discovered a lamppost. And what he did was take a mighty swing at that lamppost, which produced a loud, very satisfying noise. But it turned out that he swung just as the East Coast, about 10 or 12 years ago, experienced a major blackout. That is, it was a blackout that extended all the way from Baltimore up into the Boston area. I mean, it just wiped out the entire East Coast. And as it turned out, he took a swing at that lamppost, and the lights went out. Now, of course, it was strictly an, an illustrious correlation that was being illustrated there, but the kid dissolved into tears and ran home to tell his mother that he had done it. He'd turned out all of Boston. But it was an illustrious correlation that was, that was operating in, in that particular case. I love that example. Uh, in any case, um, let's talk about another kind of heuristic, and there's another one that we're all guilty of, and you're probably not even aware of it. And that is what's called um, essentially an anchoring adjustment hierarchy. What's involved there is that there are many circumstances under which this heuristic can bias our decision making and problem solving. What is involved is that when the form of an when we form an opinion about the likelihood of some event occurring, we may make a wild-eyed guess and we'll you know we'll even label it that way sometimes or more diplomatically we'll say going to make an educated guess thus and so will happen with such and such a frequency as our initial estimate with the full intention of revising that estimate upward or downward um, if the the um, in light of our experience once once we know we make the estimate but then we you know we're promising we'll adjust it up or down well it turns out the anchoring adjustment heuristic identifies the tendency to adjust our estimate in the correct direction but not far enough that is we are unduly influenced by our original estimate which essentially anchors us, and hence the name, the, the anchoring adjustment heuristic that's involved there. Okay? One really challenging and frightening example was cited by Leahy and Harris in, in their 2001 Cognitive Psych text, um, in which they reported on a 1998 study by McGlone and Reed. And in essence, what was involved there was the, the McGlone and Reed study involved medical decision-making tasks. That is, the, the doctors who were being tested, or the medical personnel, it wasn't just doctors, were being uh, tested in this situation by being posed particular kinds of problems, and they were to estimate the, the various probabilities that this, that, or the other kind of outcome would result from it. And in order to help you out, the researchers said, let's define high as uh, a high probability is say 94%, 94 out of 100 times, that would be a high estimate of, of something occurring. And we'll say a low probability is, is say 6%. And they anchored it with 94 and 6. Those anchors were demonstrated through many repeated uh, exhibits of it to influence other terms such as slight chance or likely in later medical, medical decisions that were based on those initial arbitrary probabilities. I mean, it was just pulled right out of thin air. That is, when it was presented to people, the, the vagueness with which it was identified was, was right there in the same way that I presented it to you. That it was, well, let's just say 94% is high. Uh, and it was quite that arbitrary. But what happened was that those starting points essentially anchored the subsequent medical decisions because you and I do tend to judge likely and, and probable and slight chance and so forth. Um, anchored on our, our various degrees of negative certainty or, or positive certainty. We'll return to this subject uh, again a little bit later, including some of the biases and problems that are built into abstract studies of such heuristics. But I wanted to raise these heuristics as examples of the processes that can influence problem solving uh, in not particularly subtle ways in, in particular situations. And let me just pose another one for you, and that is the representativeness 
uh, heuristic. The representative heuristic is uh, representativeness heuristic is based on the statement that the uh, the probability that an event A from class B can be derived from how well A represents the properties of class B. Okay, so what I'm saying the representative hypothesis, representativeness heuristic involves is that an event A, uh, the probability that event A from class B can be derived, um, the, the probability of that can be derived from, from how well A actually represents the properties of class B. Tversky and Kahneman did the classic study on this back in 1974, and all the rest of the examples are going to come, I'm going to cite, come directly from that article by Tversky and, and Kahneman. And they gave us the following description. Listen up to this. Pick one male at random from the U.S. population. The male, Robert, wears glasses, speaks quietly, and reads a lot. Is it more likely that Bob, I'll call him that, is a librarian or a banker? Now keep in mind this study was done back in 1972. A majority of the subjects in that study, having listened to the description that I just gave you, judged that Bob was a librarian. Okay, because I talked about him as wearing glasses, as speaking quietly, and as reading a lot. All of which turn out to be true of librarians. But the subjects were influenced in that decision by the representativeness heuristic. Because in essence, the, the base rate of farmers is many more than librarians, at least in 1972. That may be changing with the commercial buying of, of farms. But, but in essence, in 1972, when the study was actually conducted, um, the, the farmers way outnumbered the number of librarians in, in the general population. Now, there's a problem with that particular interpretation that I've just laid on you there, as, as uh, Tversky and Kahneman mentioned, and that is that, that um, did that did knowledge of that base rate actually influence the the um, the the decision, or was it simply unavailable? Because yeah, we know for sure factually that there were more farmers than librarians in in 1972, but did the people making that judgment actually realize that and know it, or or not? So Ta Kahneman, Tversky, and Kahneman actually tested. In 100 people, they made the, the statement, essentially, they developed the following uh, general statement, and that is, in 100 people, 70 are lawyers and 30 are engineers, in a group of people that have been assembled. In a group of people, there are 70 lawyers and 30 engineers. What are the chances a randomly selected person from that group will be an engineer? And people generally, logistically, can very quickly tell you with certainty they know that the odds are only 23% that we'll actually be able to draw a, a farmer. And then they add the follow, uh, sorry, I misspoke there. I was headed into the next page of my notes. Essentially, they know that 30% will be engineers. The, the, the odds of drawing an engineer are simply 30%, three in 10 in that problem. Tversky and Kahneman then added the following paragraph of information. Jack is a 45-year-old man. He is married and has four children. He is generally conservative, careful, and ambitious. He shows no interest in politics and social issues and spends most of his free time on his many hobbies, which include home carpentry, sailing, and mathematical puzzles. What that piece of information, which was irrelevant to the, to the drawing that was proposed, did was to greatly increase the judgments um, that the randomly selected person is an engineer, greatly increased that likelihood. It also increased um, when facts such as uh, the person who was selected graduated from the U of H uh, College of Engineering and has a degree in engineering. Um, and in fact, um, the, the, it's tangential information because what we're doing is selecting at random a given individual. And, and what, what's happening is, we'll show you in the, the logic section in the next several lectures, that, that what I've given you subsequently does not impact the fact that there were 70% of one and 30% of the other in the original sample. And so the extra information should not have influenced the, the decision as to the odds that you selected one or the other in that situation. Consider this. Lanella Sue is 31 years old. She's single, outspoken, and very bright, having majored in philosophy. As a student, she was deeply concerned with issues of discrimination and social justice, and she also participated in anti-nuclear demonstrations. Which of the following alternatives is more probable? Okay, Lanella Sue is a bank teller, or Lanella Sue is a bank teller and is active in the feminist movement. The first is more likely. 
Okay, that is that she's simply a banker, period. But for Tver Tversky and Kahneman's study, 85% of the people in that study selected the second, the idea that she was a, a banker who was an active feminist in the issues. What they did was to violate what is called the conjunction rule. Okay, the conjunction rule essentially states that the probability of the conjunction of two events, A and B, can't be greater than the probability of the single constituents, A alone or B alone. Okay, that's the only way it can occur. And in fact, mathematically, you could derive the fact that in a typical sampling situation, the likelihood that A and B will combine together is the probability of the one multiplied times the probability of the other, which further reduces the combination of both A and B being together. But in essence, it was the representativeness heuristic that, that caused this problem. The description of Linella Sue as, as uh, fits the idea of the typical person's view of what a feminist does, okay? But the odds of finding both a banker and a feminist are smaller than that of finding a banker alone. And yet people were still willing 85% of the time to say that the, the one selected at random from a 7-3 combination is going to be not only a banker, but also an active feminist banker. There's a related problem here that we can also talk about for a minute, and this one is, is a mind bender, okay? And that is the law of large numbers, okay? As we know, male and female births are essentially equal, all right, in births. Let's suppose that we have two hospitals that serve a city. The large one averages about 45 births a day, and the smaller one averages about 15 births a day, okay? If both hospitals record for a year, the days in which that ratio exceeds 60%, that is where male births exceed 60% of the overall sample, which hospital is going to record more such days in the course of a year? Okay. 22% in that sample selected the larger hospital. As it turned out, 22% also selected the smaller hospital. 56% said there was no difference. And in fact, the correct answer is the smaller hospital. And if you think about it, it makes sense in terms of sampling. Because given that the smaller hospital only has 15 births a day, in order to get 60%, they need only nine to get in excess of 60%. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, in fact, eight would do it. Um, seven, well, in any case, you can work out the math. But in any case, the likelihood, the swing in percentage bases in the smaller hospital will be wider than in the big hospital. And hence, the smaller hospital is the one where it's more likely to happen. That leads to the final of, of the techniques that we're going to talk about here, and that is what's called a confirmation bias. And that is the fact that, in essence, Wason, in 1960, um, did a study that pretty well speaks to the issue here. And that is, you will be given, the problem that he posed was the following. You will be given three numbers which confirm to a simple rule that I have in mind. Your aim is to discover the rule by writing down sets of three numbers together with your reasons for their choice. After you have written down each set, I shall tell you whether your numbers conform to the rule or not. When you feel highly confident that you've discovered the rule, you are to write it down and tell me what it is. <coughs> On page 131 of, of Wason's uh, study back in 1960. The example that was given is the number series 246. And what, what happened was that Wason simply went around as people were writing down series to, to figure out what the rule was that was being utilized. And he simply said yes or no. When he read the series that you wrote, he simply looked at it and said yes, that's correct, or no. But he did not confirm the logic by which they generated it. He simply reacted yes or no. The problem was that in many instances, the number sequence that had been generated was, was true, but not correct. That is, the rule that they had offered was not correct. They'd used the wrong rule to generate a number series. The actual rule that he was working with was simply three numbers in increasing order of magnitude. And the problem is that what you, have, you and I very often tend to do is to simply the most effective way to solve that problem would be to try to generate number series that do not follow the rule, so that you can scope out what the limits of the rule that are, that are in mind actually are. People don't tend to do that. You and I tend instead to look for things that prove what we know, okay? And so people kept coming up with rules that where they were being told yes, 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 and they were using the most common, commonly guessed rule was, was uh, sequences of, of, um, of, of three numbers generated or increasing by two numbers. But in essence, um, 
taint. So confirmation bias is what happens there. You saw that uh, during the, the le any presidential election. You'll see it. You argue with somebody of the other party. And in fact, you cite all the reasons why you believe in candidate so-and-so. And you explain those in perfect detail to a perfectly good friend who looks at you and says, that's irrelevant. That's really not the key issue. And they've simply blown off the evidence that you have in terms of, of why that candidate is good as opposed to somebody else. And it always happens. All of us, Republicans and Democrats, are walking around with a confirmation bias. So we dismiss what the other party says and simply believe intensely what our party is saying, whatever that may be. That's nothing more than a confirmation bias, and it doesn't always lead to the correct choice. So in any case, let's go back and pick up where we were talking about before, and that is to define another element for you, which is an algorithm. And that is simply a set of rules that will solve a problem if the rules are correctly followed in that situation. And that was what Paglia used in, in, the, in the book that he developed, was a, was a set of, of essentially four recommendations for how to solve a problem. The first thing you need to do is to understand it. That is, the problem needs to be stated in, in a way that allows you to start thinking about it. You might diagram it, you might sketch it, a lot of different possibilities. But the second thing you do then in this situation is to devise a plan. You find a similar problem, maybe that you've solved previously. You can brainstorm about it. You can discuss it with others. There are a lot of possibilities as to what may be done here. Um, and then the, the third possibility is that you, you basically implement the plan that you're, you're doing. You carry it out, all right? This has to be conducted carefully with attention to details to make sure that you can follow your steps when you, when you solve the problem. And then once you've got a solution, what you have to do is stand it up against whatever you were asked to do to begin with. And that is, is it adequate to the problem? Does it in fact respond to whatever challenge you've been thrown in that situation? Moreover, does it generalize to other problems? That was where the Wason study was so interesting because it kept encouraging people to generate examples. Sure. They met the specifics, but they didn't meet the generality of, of the rule that was involved there. This is essentially the procedure that is used by those that have, have studied artificial intelligence. Those are the rules that are, that are basically being, um, being utilized in that kind of a situation. Take, for instance, a, a simple game like uh, Gomoku. Okay, I don't know whether it's being pronounced correctly or not, but in any case, that's the way I'm going to talk about it. Ben Jafield did a really interesting study of that back in 1993. In essence, what's involved here is a problem like you've probably seen previously, where you've got essentially um, a, a grid, basically of, of X's or O's, that you can put into squares. <clears throat> and basically, in order to solve this, what, what you're trying to reach for is a progressive series of, of things. For instance, um, five in a row is the goal. That is, whether you're, whether you're playing X or O in this situation, your goal is to get to X or O. All right? And so if you happen to be the X player in this particular situation, you have what is called an open four in this position. And in essence, you're going to win the game because it doesn't matter if, you're comp if your opponent goes down here and blocks this end, you've still got the other end when it's your turn. Okay, so that's what's called an open four. It would be considered a closed four if it were slid down one more position so that this were the, the, the bottom X, because in that case, then the only direction you could fill it in would be at the top end. So that's a closed four, but it is still um, in competition. The other possibility then is that you may have two threes. That's a roughly equal comparison in terms of competitive strength because then you can start, uh, you can subtly start trying to build on that as, as you're going through it. And so we can create a number of different sub goals that are achievable before the goal is ultimately achieved, and that is five in a row. We've got an open four, we could have two open threes, we could have a constricted four, we could even have two constricted threes. That would be another possibility. And in addition, in fact, we can actually rank the defensive moves that would also be uh, logical to apply in this situation. Um, and obviously, as a, as a defender, blocking uh, a four is highest among the defensive maneuvers uh, for desirability. But for each move, the computer, the computer can assess all possible moves with the highest value uh, being the move that you should actually make. And when we do that, um, that Gomoku is, is an easy game to program because essentially it, it requires, first of all, that we have data that we can structure in some way. That can be done by diagramming the, the um, game current status and using that to understand the problem. And then we have to be able to evaluate um, function. We also have to have an evaluative function in there uh, where we can test options. We can create or try out, carry out various kinds of, of uh, possible responses and look at the effect. We can evaluate the, the effects that we get there. So the, the problem spell, space for, for Gomuku is, is simple. Okay. 
With chess, it is very complex. In fact, it's devastatingly complex. In fact, it limits the amount of forward thinking most of us can do, not computers, but for us humans. Because in essence, when you're playing an effective game of chess, you have to be anticipating your moves two to five moves ahead of the move that you're actually making at that point. And so if there are 30 possible legal moves that you can make, there are 10 to the 15th possible moves that you can actually make. That is combinations of different kinds of, of, um, of, of maneuvers in that case. And we can diagram it with a search tree showing each possible um, move that could be made. That is, well, mathematically, we can do it that way, but we cannot assess it algorithmically. What that leads to is what is sometimes called in examining the various moves. What it leads to in chess is what's called a combinatorial explosion. There are simply too many possibilities by the time you get five moves out as to what might happen, because, of course, the unknown is what your opponent is going to actually do in that situation. That led to, eventually, that is the concern for, for chess and, and then ultimately for math, to the development of what's called the, the general problem solver. And in fact, there, there are several different ways in which you can do this. One of the, one of the, one of the classic examples of this is, is the, uh, the Tower of Hanoi problem, which is another of my favorites. In this case, what you've got are three rings and three stakes. And what you're supposed to do is to move all rings from the first to the third stake. You do it by moving one ring at a time, and without ever having the larger ring on top of the smaller ring. That's a no-no. You can't put a big ring on it. You have to put any ring on a ring which is larger than itself. Okay? You can do this easily at home with, with just a dime, a nickel, and a quarter. I mean, that's one of the easiest ways to replicate this. But in essence, if you watch the GPS solve the Tower of Hanoi problem, it simply exhibits a number of different possibilities. You can start from, from either moving the smallest to the middle or to the right circle, and then what you do is move the middle size to the other area, whichever that happens to be. Because remember, you can carry the smallest from one end to the other. Uh, it's only where you put it down that has the rule limiting what goes on. And so in essence, what we do there is, is to establish a sub-goal. That's the easiest way to do it. Move the small and the medium to the middle as one possibility. And that's obviously not what I diagrammed. But this is another possibility. You'll have to go back and play these out slow, slow motion for you. But basically, at this point, we've gotten the big one partway over, which was our sub-goal. And so now we're going to move the smallest to the, to the right and the, the middle-sized on top here. Still not the state that we need. So now we're going to move this over to the other side. And in fact, then move it over here and move this over to the to the. Uh, right. So now we're two-thirds of the way through to where we need to be, and the rest is pretty simple. And that is you move the big one, the small one over here, you put the middle one here, and then you have to put the, this one back over here while the, the middle one is moved in on top, and then the last move is pretty obvious. Okay? I did it. And I did that all on my own without looking at the answer key. I'm so proud. All right? So we transfer that into, we transmit it, convert it ultimately into mathematical statements, okay? And in, we can use this, this technology basically to, to develop uh, various kinds of rule systems that will allow us to do this. And in, in the most abstract, oh, I wanted to recommend this site to you, and it, it is current. It was still current the last time I taped, or I should, it was current the last time I taped it, and I went back and checked it just yesterday, and it is still current. You might want to actually copy that down uh, and, and go in and look at that, because it, it's actually based at RPI, and the fellow who's developed it has a wonderful array of the kinds of problems that we've been talking about all semester in the class here. And it's just a real trip to kind of go through and, and see some of the different things that he's done the puzzles that are posed and the, the solutions that he's actually uh, generated in that particular uh, situation. Uh, so that's a site that I would recommend that you go have a look at. But basically, what you develop in solving the Tower of Hanoi is essentially a search tree. And, and in, in developing that, what you're going to do is, is to, uh, what Simon did actually, was to develop a, a notation system that basically included two different things, a condition and an action. And the, the production rule is essentially condition leads to various kinds of actions. And, and the, the problem then is considered to be solved when, you've, when, you've, um, when the, the action that it requires is halt. That is, the condition does, in fact, match the goal state.
And so in essence, what the GPS does is exactly what we've been talking about, and that is to, to do a means-end analysis to resolve the problem. So it can start from both ends of, of the solution and back toward the middle, hopefully that the, the two states will, be, will match each other. And the accompaniment there, or the accomplishment then, is, is simply to check the differences between the current and the goal state. If it's reduced, you establish another sub-goal, which is closer to the goal state. And what this yields then, ultimately, is simply a, the, through the means ends analysis, uh, it yields essentially the, the, um, the establishment of the, of the sub-goals, uh, checking the difference, which I've just talked about. And then finally, it yields what is called a goal stack. That is, at the bottom of the stack, as you create the rule system, is the goal state itself, what you're driving toward. And above it is the goal, which, which the goal state, from which the goal state can be reached. And we simply back through that all the way to the, to the, up the stack to the initial goal, moving the initial state to some intermediate sub-goal. That's, that's the mechanism by which the rule system itself is, is operating. Okay. How is it developed? Interestingly enough, it was really quite simple. And that is what they did was to study thinking aloud. Newell, Shaw, and Simon, who developed the GPS in, in various uh, cooperative ventures, essentially sought to mimic problem solving um, mouthed by actual subjects who were so while they were solving the problems. And so thinking aloud is an example of what is called concurrent verbalization. That is, what was verbalized was, was the information uh, as the subject was thinking about it. It relies there, the, the heavy emphasis there is on short-term storage. That's a key in that situation. But the other kind of, of uh, that should be contrasted with, uh, working memory should be contrasted with retrospective verbalization uh, that basically relies predominantly on, on long-term storage. Um, and basically it, it provides a description of the solution process which is called the protocol. Those, those, that combination is essentially the protocol by which any given problem can be, uh, can be solved. Um, the phrases are involved in, in describing of, of single acts, and what I want to do is to jump ahead here so that we can try to cover it in, in the remaining time to define the one other thing that we want to look at because we don't have a whole lot to say about this. Creativity has been a, a rather interesting um, aspect to try and study psychologically because in essence we can define it easily enough as, as generation of a novel and useful solution or product in any given uh, testing situation. What comes out of the, the, the literature on this is rather interesting and that is that good problem solvers are not themselves necessarily creative. Creative is, is not just on target but it, it, it's a solution which is both useful and unique. Those are what really define creativity for us. It's novel and useful, but it's on target. What tends to happen then is that, that creative solutions do tend to be extraordinary. That is, they go above and beyond in some kind of obvious way. Uh, and I'd cite two examples for you that will be instantly <laughs> visible, uh, or they'll come to mind very easily. Have you seen the ads for a vacuum cleaner that is based not on the four wheels, which they normally offer, but rather on a single cylinder, which has a, a big rubber strip in the middle of it? The cylinder is anchored at both ends to a U-shaped mechanism, which can turn any direction. So the net result is that when you're wheeling the vacuum, you can turn with a very casual, graceful curve, or you can do a very sharp turn. It really doesn't matter. Dyson, the person who developed that, has simply come away from the experience of trying to vacuum where you had only four wheels and therefore had to physically lift the vacuum to turn sharply into the development of this, which was really counterintuitive to the way vacuums are supposed to be. Turned out the same gentleman also came up with a solution to another problem that you and I face, and that is when we have to dry our hands. He looked at the blowers that were being used and he realized that it was really the blowing that was the key thing that was involved. Because if you think about it, you and I do not have a sense for wet. If we experience wet, it's because the, there's pressure on our hands and there's a temperature difference, either hot or cold, depending on what you put your hand into. But there is no wet touch per se. And it turns out there's no easy way to dry ourselves off. And so what he did was come up with the idea that instead of frying it off the way you do with hot blowers, what he did was literally create a very high intensity stream. And so if you've seen one of the new blowers in, in restrooms, I've been in one so far that's had it, what happens is that when you put your hand in between these two very high intensities, I mean, they don't hurt, but they're very high intensity. They're moving a lot of air. What they're doing is literally blowing the water off your skin because it's not magically attached to it or attached to it. It's simply, you know, it's on the skin and the goal is to get it off. You, you don't want to do this when you're wearing a suit. Um, 
Of course, the other danger is you stick it between the air blasts and it blasts right back onto your clothing. So you may still have problems with that creative solution. But both of those are really high creativity solutions to the, to the various problems we have with cleaning and, and so forth. Several books have, have been written um, on the myth of, of genius um, arguing essentially that, that really what's involved there is ordinary thought processes th that are thought processes that are methodically accumulating information um, and that there are no sudden insights or, or leaps or unconscious processes involved. Consider, for instance, the Wright brothers, who, yes, were ingenious to have us flying now, but in fact that work was based on many, many experiments which themselves resulted in failure. All we see the movies of is the last successes, but, you know, it's a mistake to think that was it. That's where they discovered flying. No, there were years of research that went into that. Um, or Watson and Crick's discovery of the RNA molecule. Same effect. Uh, sorry, not RNA, DNA. Uh, molecules, same effect. I mean, all we see is the ultimate research in, in uh, science. But in fact, there were years of studies that went into the eventual proposal that led to our description of, of DNA. And so ultimately, Dietrich in 2004 suggested that the cognitive neuroscientific analysis that he performed suggests that circuits that process information to yield non-innovative combinations of info are the very same ones that yield the innovative solutions. We'll pick it up with a very brief summary of that at the beginning of the next lecture.